Good evening, indie community. Uh, welcome to Splam. That is self-publishing like a motherfucker. The Not At All Safe For Work podcast where we interview fellow self-published authors and pick their brains for the secrets to their success. With me this evening is my co-host, Claire Taylor. Hello. Hi. Hi. And joining us from the uh, Authors and Dragons crew today, uh, we've got we've got a few of you. Uh, we got Rick Walteri, we got Steve Wetherill, and John Hartness. Hello, hello. Hey, what's up? Lots of hosts tonight. All right, anybody got any news? I do. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of, I think. I, uh, I announced yesterday, perhaps prematurely, that... Uh, CF7 should be releasing this coming weekend, uh, but you know I'm still waiting on those last few chapters to get back from my editor, so hopefully I didn't lie. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, I've got a release date for Black Knight Chronicles 7, the long-delayed new book in that series. It's going to come out on April 19th. And the audiobook for Quincy Harker Season 4 will release on April 30th. So I've got two pretty big releases coming in the month of April. So amazing that you can schedule those like that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I got, uh, I have, uh, I just approved the, the audiobook for Strange Days, Bill of the Dead 1. And it will come out whenever Audible says it will come out. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I roll. Yeah, we're talking audiobooks. The Last Volunteer is finally out there for all you impatient guys who just need that audio fix. Uh, it's got a very cool narrator. Me uh, makes my jokes work, so that'll do me. And of course, what are we already getting? People say, when do we get volume two? <laughs> That's good. As long yeah. as they keep annoying you, then uh, they'll keep you busy. And that means they're annoying me instead of annoying you. Yes, there is that. <laughs> you know, I, f- I firmly expect there to be a couple of knife fights over people, like, you know, debating what to use their credits for first. <laughs> well, I hope so. In fact, I will be very disappointed if there are not. I actually really want them to use their credits on stuff that I don't publish so that they can spend their cash on the shit that I do publish. That's sneaky. <laughs> I'm not a good person. <laughs> Claire, you got any news? Um, let's see. I have been real slow on stuff, but I am launching uh, a pre-sale for my uh, story alignment service in the next few days, hopefully. Um, What's your story alignment service? It is a story consulting service, but it's you buy like one hour with me. Um, yeah, I, I sell by the hour, which I swear is totally <laughs> legit. What if I only last three minutes? <laughs> Well, you are prematurely uh, <laughs> releasing all these books, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, I, it's just like a, basically a critique partner. You send me a uh, – you fill out a form about your story. I look over it. I come up with ideas. I figure out, you know, if you're stuck on, stuck on something, we talk about that. Uh, we brainstorm ideas. Or if you just like your book but you're ready to take it to the next level and really enrich themes and that sort of thing, we chat for an hour and you come out a uh, – more inspired author for it at least that's the claim i i i I gotta ask so Mm -hmm. what happens if i send you a story i pay for an hour with you and you get it and it just sucks well i mean i can take it help you take it to the next level i'm not going to make every every story a masterpiece and really it's less of me shaping the story and more of me guiding the author through their story. So there are, I mean, there are some limitations, but it will always be a better story on the other side of it. That's awesome. I can very easily spend an hour saying this is shit in a lot of different ways, dude. I mean, come on. (laughs) You have to be very diplomatic about it. That's what you get paid for. This is, this is why you insist on payment up front, no refunds. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, they paid ahead. Fuck them. <laughs> There's a reason I don't offer this service. Yeah, I, 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 I give you, yeah, I give you credit. I've, I'm thinking myself. I'm like, how, how long before this would drive me insane? <laughs> oh, I love it because I don't. It's not like a developmental edit where you get the whole manuscript and you go, oh no. <laughs> uh, it's you know, it's like we just talk about their story when we work on the best parts or the parts they're stuck on and we can always come up with something 
Um, but I'm not responsible for everything in their manuscript making sense. It's it's more of their self evaluation and me helping with that. So that's nice. So it's kind of kind of like you're you're a sounding yeah, board. Essentially. Yeah, I am. I'm a critique partner, but okay. it, I don't know if you guys have ever had like a critique group that really just wanted to tear you apart and make you feel like shit. Um, I'm not that. I, that, I, I was going to say I call I call that my beta reading group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's very growth focused and I have I have no ego in this game, so I'm not going to like try and make someone feel stupid. Um and it's hard to find a good critique partner and so Yes, it does. Oh, yeah. I make yeah. it make it nice and affordable and people can come for each book they want to come talk to me um you know or if they want to buy it uh 2 or 3 hours and then we split it up and talk throughout the process. It's you know, it's all pretty flexible. No, I think that's I think that's pretty pretty awesome because you're right. It's like it it is hard to find like you know you can find like a local like author group with critique group and it's like yeah you just want to it's it's like why am I showing you this? Mm-hmm. And but then it's like you know somebody who is who's established. I, th- I think I think that's really awesome putting something out there that's reasonable from somebody established who like you know to like you know to to help. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's fun. I love it. I did something similar a year or so ago where I did what I called a deep beta read for a, for a friend. And yeah, I enjoyed it. We, I went through and I went through the whole thing and took it apart, but so it was a little different, but it was kind of the same thing because by the time we were done, I was like, so we're going to rethink some things and here's how you're going to take this thing apart. And he's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I also do developmental edits like that too, but it does, it costs so much because it takes so much of my time. Yeah. I'm not selling myself short here, you know, like I do have expertise. So, um, but, it, but I wanted to do something that's affordable that people can plan on like sort of folding into their writing process. Yeah. And I imagine if people are paying for this, you're probably automatically weeding out the egomaniacs who don't want to hear anything other than their story is brilliant. <laughs> Well, I haven't had a male client yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, burn! Uh, yeah, I say we, uh, I say we take up a collection and give her a troll client. <laughs> Go for it! All right, well, great. Good luck with that, Claire. Um, without further ado, I will introduce tonight's guest. With us today, we have John P. Logsdon. Uh, I understand you work at NASA. Funny story. <laughs> um, actually, uh, you laugh, but uh, I had been getting phone calls for that guy <laughs> since I was 17 years old. Um, <laughs> now I'll be 52 in two days. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I remember I, so many times I would get phone calls from him, and I had no idea what these people were talking about. And then I went to college for astrophysics and realized I wasn't that smart, so I went instead to programming. But um, what ended up happening was when the Challenger incident occurred, I got a phone call, and I was getting tired of this because it was constant. And I was pretty pissed off about the whole Challenger thing. You know, it, was, it sucked, right? And I remember them calling up, and they're saying, you know, is this John Logs? And I said, yes. And I knew immediately what was going on. And they said, um, so what did you, what do you, do you have a comment on, on the, uh, space shuttle, uh, incident? Do you have a, you know, what do you think of it? And I said, I think it fucking sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Eloquent. And there was a pause followed by, can I quote you on that? I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I, was I don't just... think they ever quoted me on that. But, um, then, <laughs> then when I turned 40, my mom called him by accident. <laughs> and um, said, you know, can, I want to speak to John. And the guy's wife is just like, well, who's calling? She says, it's his mother. She says, that's not possible. <laughs> 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 Unless you're calling from area code 666. I don't think that's going to work. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, so she called him on my birthday and wished him a happy birthday. And then he ends up, you know, saying, well, tell him happy birthday. Well, you owe him money for all the calls he's had to field for you. But, um, yeah, so it, it's been a fun life uh, living in his shadow. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I Googled Jib, and, like, you know, his picture comes up, and my first thought is, like, okay, like, I've talked to John a couple times online. I'm like, are we going to get somebody on the phone who's going to be like, back in my day, we wore onions in our belts? And- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm standing here with my walker right now. Mm-hmm. I got to say, I, I respect the audacity it took to try and ride that guy's coattails into astrophysics school. 
<laughs> exactly. As soon as I saw that, I'm like, well, there's no winning in this game. <laughs> Come on, you, you, you should with a few of your professors, you should have done the, do you know who I am thing? Yeah. Ah, oh, well, we've talked a bit for somebody, about somebody that's not you. Uh, how about you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's far more interesting. Um, so about me, uh, well, let's see, I started out uh, as a game developer, um, you know, back when I was a kid, and then I ended up working in uh, online industry and then the games industry for quite a while, uh, 20 years, I guess, in the games industry, um, everything from a developer to a producer to an executive producer, um, blah, 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 the whole deal. And during that time, uh, I actually had met uh, Chris Young, who is one of my co-authors, and he and I, you know, shared a love for science fiction and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he actually had introduced me to um, Robert Asprin. And um, I started reading the myth adventure stuff, really, you know, had fun with that and everything. And uh, so one day I said, hey, why don't we, you know, joke around, write something, do whatever. And uh, so we started working on some things and they were just terrible. Um, but after a while, um, you know, we started getting a little bit better at it. Went to the Gotham School for Writing um, you know, just all that kind of stuff. And we had to write a lot of game documents together. Uh, nothing you've probably ever heard. They were all online stuff back in the mid nineties and such. Um, but anyway, so we had to do all that. We had to do pitches to, you know, people like Spielberg and all this kind of stuff. And we just kind of got a little bit better at it as we went along. Um, and so, yeah, we eventually, uh, decided, hey, let's let's go ahead and write something together. So we tried. It was pretty bad. And then I stepped back and wrote Ononakin, the first book called The Quest of Undoing. And um, I showed it to him. And he was like, ah, I don't like that because wizards are just way too damn powerful. You know, they can blow up a whole army. And I'm like, not the way I do it. Um, so, like, my main wizard has to drink in order to have power. So the drunker he gets, the harder it is for him to do anything. Um, and so I just came up with all these stupid ways for – wizards to get their powers so he thought that was funny we ended up writing that story and then we moved into other stuff uh since then we've done science fiction uh we've done urban fantasy arthurian comedy which is king arthur and drag which is pretty fun um and just a whole bunch of other junk now we'll go back to oh no no can you said you 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 pitched that to him or you showed him a first draft I guess I kind of pitched it to him with the first draft. I said, look, here is a fantasy story, everything else. And he's like, nah, I hate fantasy. I was like, just read it. Okay. Kept on saying, I don't like wizards. And then I kind of went into that thing with him. Then he read it. He came back and he says, okay, this is great. I'm, I'm in. So it's always been like that with Chris. So, for example, when I started Platoon F, I said we had just finished um, uh, an Ononican book and, a, and a, I think the second Ononican book. And then I said, look, you know what? These are fun. I really enjoy them, but they're not dirty enough. <laughs> I want to do something that, you know, kind of channels the 13 year old in me. Um, and so I wrote Platoon F, the first one, just a fast little 20,000 word story that was just stupid and ridiculous, silly, etc. cetera. Um, actually, one guy um, reviewed it as juvenile, puerile, and I hope to never read anything this awful again. So I created an ad out of that, my best ad ever. <laughs> <laughs> You're in good company here. <laughs> yeah, I was like, are you really Robert Bevan? And uh, so. Uh, yeah, I did that. And Chris says uh, he read it. And he says, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, you know, uh, five thousand dollars and 60 days later on a 20,000 word book, he's like, yeah, I'm in. Um, and so that happened with that. And then when I did the E index first book, he's like, nah, I'm not really interested. It ended up, you know, doing really well in the first 30 days. Yeah, I'm in. So he kind of he kind of doesn't want to take the initial risk. But if it works out, he's he's all for it. That sounds like a publisher. Yeah, I was, was going to say sounds, sounds like every business partner I've had I've had in life. <laughs> sounds like what I did to Steve. I don't know, man. Comedy, science fiction. Oh wait, people are buying it. All right, fine, I'll publish it. Is Steve, even here. I am yeah. here. I'm just Steve. contemplating. I'm just trying to think how many of our collective origin stories here are. I like fantasy but I want it to be dirtier and involve more drunkenness. <laughs> I, I, I like the fact that, uh, that, that John apparently wrote the biography of like, you know, of Robert Bevan as a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. John, what, what you may not know is that Robert Bevan's actually a ninja, but he doesn't have any ninja skills until he's drunk. <laughs> Isn't that true of us all? Act. <laughs> but after the seventh or eighth beer, yeah. Yeah, we're talking, he's, he's going all John McClane. He's like, you know, climbing through the, like, you know, the air ducts and shit. <laughs> Dragging a cooler behind me. <laughs>
So, John, so, have you always co-written, or do you write a series on your own, or what? Well, I tend to write the first book on my own. Uh, and right, because then... you have Johnny come lately. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, at least to start off a series, I, I tend to do that. Um, but no, actually, what you were saying about uh, having somebody to bounce ideas off of and everything else, I thrive on that. So even when I have these other authors that I'm working with, like um, you know, I got Noah, uh, Eric, and Ben, um, and Orlando even. Um, so what we do is... We'll get together and, and those guys actually will write those books. Uh, I'll do developmental editing on them, probably write the first one about 40%. And then from there, it drops to like 20% for the second one. And then it kind of, you know, whittles down. So I'm not really putting as much words on the, on the paper as they are. But one of the fun parts of all that is sitting down and saying, okay, what's your idea? And then they, you know, they kind of tell me that. And then we sit there and work together to build a five book arc. And then individual uh, books from there and, and kind of, you know, really, um, basically build it all out. And that's the part, kind of what you were just saying you were, you were uh, charging for. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of my role there. Chris's role in our, uh, in our relationship is basically just the opposite where he does that, but I do the writing. So um, I don't know. I just find it much more fun to write with someone than to write by myself. Yeah, that are- makes sense. I mean, it is nice to have, have the sort of, especially with comedy. I mean, it's such a social uh, mindset. It's nice to be able to have that back and forth. I agree. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, I, I guess. I guess you have to be a little social yourself. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't, I don't, I've, I've run, I've run into a situation where it's where it's like you know working with somebody else and it's like no, no, that's not funny. Don't fuck you, man. I I think it's funny. <laughs> it sounds like you're working with the wrong people. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I no, no. I think you could have stopped. It sounds like you're just working with people because I'm I'm pretty sure it's me. <laughs> yeah, I was I was sitting here thinking, let's start from the premise that Rick hates everybody, <laughs> or the premise that everybody hates Rick. <laughs> Sure. It's just a matter of perspective, really. Um, one thing I can say real quick is that uh, when I work with Chris, we do something interesting. We use a program called Fade In, which is a script writing tool. And um, so on the books that I work on with him, not E-Index, but like uh, Ononakin and Platoon F um, and even uh, Queen Arthur, those books, I actually just script everything out. Because since it's comedy, it's it's a lot easier to just go, you know, um, basically dialogue, 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 dialogue back and forth because you can kind of get the timing a little better then and then you can just kind of backfill it. But what we end up doing is then getting on a call, a, a Zoom or Skype or whatever, uh, a video call, and you know he picks certain characters, I pick certain characters, and then we just literally go through the entire thing uh, like we're reading it live, um, which we do parts of that for our group and, and stuff, and you know they get a kick out of it, especially when we're drunk and do it. Um, but, yeah, it, it actually helps a lot because we get to sit there and go back and forth. And some of the jokes, if we actually crack up about, you know, it's great. Otherwise, it might be, oh, wait, wait, what if we threw this in? And what if we, you know, so it helps out a lot. And then you just kind of flesh out the whole dialogue tags and, and description around the rest of the story because you still have that information in your head or, you know, in the scene structure. But uh, just having the dialogue really helps a lot. doesn't work for things like Ian Dex, but it does work for uh, those other types of stories. Are, are you guys doing this via, like, via like voice recorder or you're actually typing it out as you go? Uh, I actually type those out. So um, Chris doesn't do any writing at all. I, I do the writing. He'll do some outlining now and then, um, but uh, I do the majority of the writing. Do you find that the co-writing process takes longer per book or does it expedite it? I, I think it actually helps. For me, it helps because otherwise I'll just sit there staring at the screen. I mean, I don't get writer's block, but I get writer's boredom. And so I'll sit there and look at the screen and just kind of go, nah, I don't feel like doing this. Um, but if I have somebody else that... You know, I kind of get jazzed about, oh, this is funny as shit. I'm going to finish this up. And then I, I send it to Chris and go, dude, you got to check this out. He'll get it. He'll start laughing. And then that kind of jazzes me to go forward. Um, and having the other authors, it's it's a case of you want to get paid? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the same experience I had with Steve when we wrote Hell's Titties. Um, <clears throat> it was, but I'd also add that uh, there's a factor of not wanting to let the other author down. It's like, you know, if he gets back to me with 10 or, you know, what, what 2,000 words, then I'm going to sit my ass down and write 2,000 words and get it back to him Just as soon as possible. I'll show him. <laughs> no, no. I, I was going to say when I when I wrote uh, Like and Moon with my friend Ruby, there was a little bit. There was a, it was it was like that friendly competition of like you know okay here's two thousand words. Well, I did th- three thousand. Oh, really? Well, I'm going to do four thousand. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's not really what I had in mind there. I was, I was thinking more like, you know, uh, I'm not the only one, um, you know, doing this. So uh, I don't want to be the the guy that, that falls behind. Mm, and that, yeah. that was probably one of the fastest books I've ever been a part of writing. Yeah, that, that – uh went really well considering it's probably well, it was definitely our first collaboration it's probably the first novel collaboration i've done that hasn't ended after the uh after we quickly realized that it wasn't going to happen so yeah it was a incredibly quick experience i do think there's something kind of i guess you don't get stuck in your own mental labyrinth as much if you write two thousand words you might not necessarily know what you're going to do next but then if somebody else is you know putting in an extra 2000 word it kind of re-inspires you and i guess helps you out of any potential quagmires you might have i, I think there's a, and maybe 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 competition is the wrong word i think there's also that inspiration aspect of it when like when you get something back from from like the co-author and it's really awesome it just makes you want to be that much more awesome right yeah you really don't want to under deliver after that yeah so i i think it'd be an important point to illustrate the difference between co-writing and ghostwriting um, because that is a hot topic right now. So from, from what you're talking about with co-writing, it's very hands-on, right? Oh yeah, totally. I, 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 I've actually, um, been approached as, uh, from somebody who would say, Hey, you want to ghostwrite that, you know, you want me to ghostwrite something and so on. I, I personally don't feel comfortable with that mainly because, and, and this is what I tell the, the guys too. I mean, Orlando writes, you know, his book, Eric writes his book, Noah writes his book, et cetera. Ben writes his book, but I, I don't. I, I make a point to say I'm not a publisher. Uh, I'm a co-author here. Yeah, I'm the guy who's putting the money behind it, but I'm a co-author here. And and so if you just run off and write something and come back, I'm gonna go. Hey, that's great. Good for you. Now let's get together and actually design what we're gonna do. Um, mm-hmm. Which you know has happened once and didn't happen again. <laughs> so uh, I want to make sure that uh, number one is it. Is it up to snuff to the mediocre level that I produce um, <laughs> or or not? You know, um, is it too good? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so I, I kind of want to make sure that, you know, they're hitting the, the proper tropes that my clients or my readers expect. You know what I mean? Uh, because if it's too clean, they're going to be like, what is this? If it's too filthy, they're going to be like, what is this? So it, it kind of has to fit in correctly. Plus, um a lot of times I'll find with uh, co-authors in, in a particular series that I'm working on is they will overcomplicate the hell out of this, uh, of a book. And I'm like, dude, no, by the time you're done with this, it's going to be like 160,000 words. We got to, you know, bring this sucker down. And, you know, I, I make them keep very simple uh, with things and keep the action moving, keep the humor moving, but also have some, you know, firefly moments where it's kind of dark and all that kind of stuff, of course. But uh, I, I really want to be heavily involved because if I'm not, I have a feeling that it's not going to be anything remotely near my voice and my name's on it. I don't like that. Yeah, that that sounds very similar to the way a lot of the um, the Bane books, co-written books come, which is. And they use it kind of like a mentorship program where big best-selling author will co-write something with a new author who doesn't have as much experience or as many sales. And then if that works out and those books are good in a couple of years after a couple of books, they will maybe publish a book by the, by the smaller name on the cover. I know David Weber has done a lot of co-writing like that, and Eric Flint does a bunch with a bunch of different people. I was going to say, it sounds, it sounds better than like the, the James Patterson like you know, model. <laughs> like, Eric, you want to be a New York Times bestseller? Write me a book, I'll put my name on it, and nobody will ever hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> right. Would yeah. anyone here publish a book under their name that they hadn't read? Just poll? Huh? Not under huh? my name, but... Uh... I might set up a pen name for that. <laughs> uh, you know, something. If 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 I didn't if I didn't read it and wasn't happy with it, I don't release anything unless I'm happy with it. No. Publish a book with my name as the author? Hell no. I mean, I publish books for Falstaff all the time that I haven't read, but I mean, we publish forty or fifty books a year, so. But somebody's read them. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> one of the people that are part of the publication drink team. Yeah, that's probably important to say. <laughs> yes. 
Falstaff don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> give yeah. us your shopping list. We'll stamp our name on it. <laughs> yeah, I may not have read them, but either me or one of the three editors that we work with. As long as somebody's read them, that's the important thing. More importantly, as long as somebody who you trust has read them. Yeah. So does anyone have any more questions for John about writing before we move on to what I'm really excited about? I mean, I'm excited about your writing. Sorry, John. Uh, but reader links, <laughs> I want to talk about reader links. Sorry, I didn't have a credit card handy. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's coming, what's coming up? What have you got in the pipeline? pimp yourself on the writer front for a little bit oh for the books um so let's see this uh friday uh we are launching book number three in the savannah sage series which is the Se seattle paranormal police department that's called blood of bones uh on the 29th orlando sanchez's uh dragon's plight from the badlands ppd that's actually pretty funny it's based on uh, it's kind of a takeoff of uh, Smokey and the Bandit, so that's kind of fun. Um, then we're doing our first uh, lit RPG book, which is called Vines of Ostera. It's from uh, Kazaron Online, which is a, a world that I created with uh, Noah St Sturdivant. And um, so that's coming out, I think it's on the 12th of uh, April. And then uh, Ben Zakheim has on the 26th, we have uh, the New York PPD book, which is, oh boy, uh, Deadly Claws, I think. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot going on. We, we I have a book coming out every two to three weeks. That's fantastic. Nice. I was just about to say that the whole, the co-offering process must be an like, incredibly expedient way to get something from concept to release. I guess it's just, you probably couldn't manage that on your own. Well, no way I can do that. On my own. I, I, I tried at one point to write that fast. It does not go well. You you burn out super quick. Yeah, I'm sure there's some superhumans out there who do do that. But uh, yeah, our I, first two guests. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, actually, that comes to mind a question. Question. I mean, with with the books coming out that fast, I mean. Do you have like one go-to editor? I mean, you, I, I don't I, like a, a small platoon of them. Like, like, how do you get that shit edited? That yeah, fast? how do you get that shit polished? <laughs> so, so we actually, I have a three-step process. Um, so the first step is that I have a team that's called the Advanced Story Squad. Yes, Team Ass, um, <laughs> and uh, nice. it's a very small team. They get uh, roughly three to five chapters a day, most every day. Um, of the book that's coming through. And um, these people are, uh, you know, really into the different series that, that I work on, and they know them probably better than I do. So anything that comes through, they're catching, like, continuity errors, you know. Hey, in book one, you said Ian couldn't talk to his own dick, and in book four, he is, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Wait, who can't talk to their dick? <laughs> what a Oh, all right. But, so anyway, you have that kind of thing. And uh, they also catch a lot of, you know, grammatical issues and so on and so forth, because there's a number of editors who are who are actually on that team. Uh, so they report everything through reader links uh, to me and then or to the author involved. And then that author kind of, you know, fixes things. So you'll end up with like 200 errors caught just from them over the course of their read. Then you uh, jump from there to Team Dam, which is Demented <laughs> and Magnificently Naughty, I think. Um, and uh, that's 170 people. And so, again, a number of people from there will eventually graduate to Team Ass, uh, which sounds really bad because I always say, welcome to my ass. You know, it's roomy in here. Um, but anyway, and um, so then I'll, I'll get like 80 signups or 100 signups or whatever for each book because some people are into a certain precinct and not another or whatever. Uh, so those people then go through it. You end up with another 100 or so uh, like that. Then I got lucky. Uh, my wife is a professional editor, has been for a very long time. Uh, so she then goes through that whole process uh, with that, which means she reads a hell of a lot of stuff that I work on. Uh, and from there, uh, we are done. So your You're wife right. edits all of these? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Mr. Step, uh, I do the developmental editing of the uh, when they come through. Before it ever gets to Team Ass, it goes through me. So I sit there and I'll catch a whole bunch of stuff. Also, I will also um, make sure that uh, nobody is stepping on any anybody else in the precinct. Like, you know, for example, I have a. Uh, maybe a series that's coming out where, you know, there's goblins or whatever. And then this person, another author starts writing about goblins in there. So I'm going, oh, wait, wait, wait. we got to kind of coordinate on how goblins act 
before you do that. So we start, you know, we'll go through that concept if they introduce something uh, to that effect. So I'll fix those things. I'll also rewrite portions of what they've done. Um, and then I give it back to them. They review it again. So we've, there's so many eyes that are looking on every single story uh, that, you know, is it perfect? No, but we catch a ton. Yeah, that's when I, with my expanded Bubba and Quincy Harker universes, the oversight of making sure that everybody's monsters do the same things is um, is one of the things that we have to pay attention to. So for that... Guys- um, one of the things that we do is we have a wiki. It's a hidden wiki. And um, Noah actually is managing it for the PPD, and he's also starting on the Kazaron one. Uh, the idea there is that uh, every everything that's brought up, uh, we enter into the wiki. And so when an author jumps to go, uh, you know, add a new character type or class or whatever, we say jump to the wiki first, verify everything is cool in there, and make sure that you add any changes or or whatever. So that way we have a central repository as opposed to it just being in my head. Because you know that sucks. Um, and again, all the people on Ask they can they could jump into that wiki as well and go, hey, you you know said here on the wiki, blah blah blah, or whatever. Um, so yeah, we do have that kind of repository for that information because there's just way too many characters and way too many monsters and stuff to keep track of manually. Nice. I need a wiki. Yeah, me too. What site do you use for that, John? Zoho.com. Z-O-H-O.com. All right. I know we want to get to reader links, but I thought we might. Uh let you wrap up with that I, before we get there I, i'd like to ask about uh marketing how, how do you market your books uh multiple ways uh so i have a uh facebook group i'm sure most of you guys do that too of course the newsletter uh multiple pages so i have a page that's kind of just for me as an author but i also have a paranormal police department page and we'll end up doing a caseron page as well uh that so whenever we do our Facebook ads and stuff, we tie it directly to that so we can build, you know, uh, all of those people uh, going to there. Also doing AMS ads, AMS Advantage ads, uh, working on BookBub ads. I have um, – uh, I've been recently working um, with a couple of people actually on uh, working on the ads and so on uh, with me and trying to help me maximize my efforts there. Um But, you know, with all the stuff that goes on between (laughs) developmental editing, writing myself, uh, because I'm writing two series on my own, and then also running reader links and all this kind of stuff, you got to have PAs to help you out. Otherwise, there's just no time. All right. Anybody have any more questions about that? Do you take weekends off, John? Weekends. I'm not familiar with this term. I must look it up. <laughs> uh, actually, no. Um, but here's why. Uh, so I worked, you know, how many years in the corporate world? I'm sure we've all been there. And, uh, you know, when I I actually got laid off on December 15th of 2017. Oh, that sucks. No, it was great. Oh, all right. Never mind. <laughs> best day Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, best day of my life. Actually, we were on a conference call and I worked from home and I was on the video and everybody in that room. <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing, but it's funny. Everybody in that room looks so sad. And I'm, I'm on the monitor. I'm the only one on the monitor. Big fucking monitor. And I have the biggest smile on my face. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember uh, one of the programmers on uh, Reader Links, he, he, after the call, he said, you are such a dick. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what? He said, the whole time, man, everybody else in there is like a funeral, and you're just big old smiling face on this massive screen. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I was pretty happy I got laid off. Um, but once I did, I, I started working harder than I've ever worked. And um, honestly, I work my ass off. I work all the time. And I love every minute of it, so I don't mind at all not having weekends. It's great. It sounds like you're spinning a lot of plates. It's a big operation. Yeah, it's cool, but yeah, yeah, I'd be paranoid about taking time off. It's like, what if I, what if I, uh, you know, you've got a rhythm going on. You don't want those plates to start dropping. Uh, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't take time off either. It sounds that. Uh, well, the good news about that, I mean, I, I've been sick a few times because, you know, it happens. But um, when that happens, I have so much that, you know, is already either preset, you know, pre-made, ready to go. I even have, like, uh, I have an extra, I think, two books right now that are ready to publish that I'm just kind of holding on to. And that way, if it comes down to it, and I'm just like, hey, guys, I just can't do any developmental editing for this week. We're going to have to, you know, alter the schedule a little bit or whatever. The guys are always, you know, we're all pretty laid back about it. 
um, because we have a buffer built in anyway. So even if we say, hey, we got to go pre-order this Friday, for example, this is actually happening right now. We were supposed to be going pre-order this Friday for Orlando's book, but um, he had he had some issues. He wasn't able to get to it in time because of uh, some other production schedule that he had going on. So because of that, we just said, OK, no worries. We're just going to launch the book next Friday and we'll start, you know, putting up a bunch of, you know, images and stuff and teasers and trying to get people all excited about it. And so we'll still launch it the same day. We're just not going to hustle to get to pre-order. That's all. So we ended up um, because. I don't know if you guys know this, but sometimes pre-orders don't work right if you put up the the uh, uh, fake file to start with. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I'm not messing with that. So if that if it comes to that, I have an extra week that I have to play with. Uh, but if I mean I got stupid sick, yeah. Well, what are you gonna do? Yeah, I was gonna say I, I've I've started putting like you know the first page where it said if you're if you if you the reader are receiving this file, Amazon screwed up. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It sounds like you got your shit together. So maybe I think that's probably the mental puzzle piece I'm missing here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I spent, I spent a number of years as a uh, product manager and a producer and you know, all that crap. So you kind of learn, especially in a startup, you kind of learn how to, uh, you know, put everything together and make sure that your time is, is well spent. You learn those things over the years and then, you know, you start applying it to yourself and realizing all the stuff. And so I, I'll put on a different hat for each thing that I'm uh, doing. Um, actually, literally, when I get into business, I put on a, a safari hat, but, you know, it's just weird, but whatever. Anyway, the point is, is that you, you can focus in on a particular task. And so I'm very ADHD, which you might hear. Um, but as I work on one particular thing, I know that there's something else I've got to do, which actually kind of keeps me centered. Otherwise, I'm going to have to go full-time Adderall, which I don't want to do. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I, I, having multiple things going actually helps me be productive. If I only had one thing to really focus on, I'd be fucked. I think this is a question we're probably going to have to ask other authors from now on. Uh, do you have a magical hat? Is this a common thing? And are you guys wearing hats right now? No, I'm wearing headphones. Hey, I'm wearing a headset. But- I have an eye mask on. Does that work? Here's the hat. <laughs> So you're Claire, you're a Batman. Is that what you're telling us? Yes, I am Batman with absolute headache. Oh, a a bat headache, though. All right. Bat headaches are cooler. Yeah. I was thinking to myself, what is it that John's got that I haven't got that allows him to do this? And now I know it's a magical hat. That's what I'm (laughs) taking away from this discussion. Yeah, it's a hat. It's got two beers on the side and the little straws going down. <laughs> Drew? He's Drew Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's another argument for my magical hat theory. So Claire has mentioned a couple of times this reader links. What is this reader links? That you speak of. That you speak of. <laughs> Basically, I'm a develop. I've been a developer, like I said. You know, I was in the games industry for a long time. I did a bunch of web stuff and blah blah blah. And um, I ended up, as I was getting into the author business and and trying to you know do all this stuff, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Like you know, most of us when we started. And so I was like, the first thing I wanted to do was okay. Somebody said you have to build Twitter and and build followers and all this kind of crap. And so I started doing that. And um, so I started, you know, going in there for like an hour a day, following people, hoping to get people to follow me. Then I was tweeting and then I was retweeting, doing all the things that you have to do. And then it turned into like two hours a day. And then I would do like two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, just doing anything to try to bump sales up. And finally, I was like, you know, they have an API. Um, I'm going to go look and see what it would take just to write my own thing. So, I, you know, kind of like your own Hootsuite type deal. But I didn't want to do the way Hootsuite does it. I wanted it a little bit different. So I just coded up this thing that allowed me to put in a whole bunch of tweets. And then it would randomly pick one and send it out every, I think I had it like every six hours or something. And it would mark that one as sent. And then it would say, okay, that one minus one. So I had 100 tweets, let's say. Then it would, now I have 99 to choose from. It would randomly grab from. And then 98, 97, et cetera. And so, um, It was just kind of cool. And a couple of other authors, uh, you know, like, well, you know, Orlando is one of them. Shane Silvers, uh, Ben Zackheim, Eric Knowles. I basically said to them, hey, I have this, you know, thing. Do you want to give it a shot? They were like, sure. You know, we'll try it out. And they were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. So they started using that. Then I was working with uh, Bitly. This was before things like Booklinker and and those. Um, And 
whenever you would put in a link or, or, you know, try to set up a link for Bitly, it starts, it starts to get really difficult because you have all these things, the back of your book, newsletter, your, your Facebook post or whatever, and you're trying to track all these things, but you're also doing it over, you know, 50 books. And it's just such a pain in the ass to, to try to track it. And then you go, I want to go back and see where this particular link connects to or, or what the current, you know, stats are on this link. Well, their interface for that stuff was just terrible. And um, then Booklinker came out, and theirs was better, uh, but and it also at least gave you geo-targeting, which was nice, but it was still not great. So um, I said, well, okay, let me write one of these things. So I coded that up, and uh, the guys started using that too. And then I said, you know, another thing would be cool, and another thing would be cool, and it just kept on kind of growing from there. Um, and so I kept building these little tools until finally these guys, you know, were saying, dude, a lot of authors could really benefit from this. You should just kind of put it all together into one thing. Um, and that's when, you know, I did that. And then I hired on, um, uh, Rafal, who is, who are, are now our CTO. Uh, I don't really act in that role anymore. Thank God. And, um, he started doing all the code. He basically came in and fixed all the shit that I did. <laughs> he made it good. Um, so he's still working on some stuff to improve things even more and make it more efficient and so on. And we're still growing uh, the uh, the service. But there are a lot of bells and whistles that come with reader links. And one of our agreements uh, was that we didn't want to price gouge because, I don't know, the way I see it is, is that when I started as an author, I needed something like this and I didn't have the money to go, you know, forking out on it. And it's not like we need to, you know, make 50 bucks a person per month on this thing to be profitable. As it, as it gets more and more customers, obviously the server gets bigger uh, and all that kind of stuff. And as we add more and more features, it's, you know, it costs us more. So we kind of have to scale a little bit, but our ultimate goal is to try to keep it as uh, cheaply priced as we can. And if you have a coupon code, for example, you can get it for basically $9.99 a month. Uh, and it does give you all the same basic features as like book report does. Uh, we have, you know, uh, it brings in your KDP reports. It, it does all that stuff. Plus you can also upload your Facebook ads reports and your Amazon ads reports, your Amazon advantage reports. So it'll show you your ROI, um, what you're actually making on these things, um, which is also really cool. And since you, if you use the reader links, it'll tie those links in so you can kind of see, um, you know, how your links clicks are scaling with your spends which really helps you kind of get a baseline idea, at least a trajectory idea of how your stuff's going as far as like, you know, my ROI is going up, my clicks are going up, which means my ads are performant or my posts are performant, whatever, um, and so on. And we recently have entered in the ability to uh, do the Facebook pixels directly from our links so you don't have to weed through your uh, WordPress site, which is really super slow. And um, if you weed through WordPress, for example, your Facebook ads might not uh, serve to everybody because what they'll do is they'll kind of do a test against your link and see how long does that link actually take to get there. And if it ends up taking more than N number of seconds, uh, they actually will lower the number of people they send that link to. And so if you go, if you use a reader link specific link, then they're almost instant. They take less than a second to get there. So I found my impressions and my clicks went up drastically by switching over to that. The problem was, is we didn't have any way to fire off your pixels. Now we do. So now you can actually use your pixels, um, you know, straight through our link. So it's just a lot of stuff that we do, a lot of stuff that we want to do uh, going forward with the system, but it just takes time. Uh, however, it's been accepted really well. And a lot of authors uh, who use it. Yeah, I got. I got to say, I mean, I, I see a lot of the tools out there, and I, I see people complaining all the time about like about book report, about machete, about like you know whether it's pricing, stuff's breaking. I mean, with with reader with reader links, I mean, you, I, I see the occasional one off, essentially, like you know, I can't figure out how to do something, but uh, you, you don't you don't really see uh, you don't really see that with that wide scale. Uh, you know, why, why the hell am I using this tool uh, with 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 that? So so kudos. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. We work really hard because the way we see it is we're authors, too. We're not just anything that you see in that system. It's because one of us went, man, I really want that, <laughs> you know. And so it, obviously, from our perspective, we're running our author businesses, too. So we want things to be you know, working properly and, and, and everything else. A lot of times, though, it does come down to, OK, this particular feature, like, for example, a lot of people were saying, oh, I'm wide. I want to have all my Apple reports in and my Barnes and Noble reports. And then we say, OK. 
Um, we think that's cool. That's awesome. We would like to see that too. But is that more important than say having your BookBub ad reports listed in there? And then they go, Oh no, I want that. And it's like, well, which one do you want first? Cause you can't have both. And so <laughs> you, you start figuring that out, but even worse is the case of, all right, when we go to put in your Apple report, that's not only going to take us two months to do. It's also going to have to, um, you know, push all these other things back because we have to totally change the way the system works for that. And that's why Rafal right now has is going back into the system and he's doing what's called the 2.0 back end. And the idea there is make it so it's a lot easier for us to work with a lot more plug and play for us. So we can do those things like, you know, be more nimble uh, with stuff. Yeah, because you were really quick to get um, hardcovers added in for me last year. Fortunately, that was easy. And <laughs> that's one thing. <laughs> that's one thing. If it ends up being a, uh, a programming project that I can take on, uh, usually that means they're pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, and I don't have to dig into the, the depths because if I have to dig into the depths, I'm not writing. And, and so on. That's that's why Rafal is actually here. He's the one who's supposed to be taking care of all that. Plus, if I do something that's deep, he's just going to have to fix it anyway. So he doesn't let me. Um, <laughs> smart guy. Yeah, very smart. So one of the things I am uh, trying to do, and um, uh, so I'll let you know about this here, is I'm working on the ability to see what your read through is. And that's kind of going off of Michael Cooper's uh, spreadsheet. And I already talked to him about it. He was like, yeah, man, totally. Uh, so that's cool. So the idea being that, you know, you can go into your individual book record, type in the KENPC uh, value that you get, you know, off of the KDP site. And then um, from there, if you do that with all of your books, we can kind of calculate based on your drop down. You could say, uh, you know, what's my read through yesterday or this week or last month or whatever. And you set like this thing and it can kind of. It's all a guesstimation, obviously, um, but it it uh, can kind of go through and say, hey, you know, you've got a, a 50 percent read through from book one to book two. But from book two to book five, you're at like 90 percent. So maybe the first person, you know, person from book one just didn't like your shit. But as soon as they if, if the people who did get to book two pretty much went through your entire series and those are the people you want anyway. But being able to know that gives you, you know, some insights as to, is my advertising working? Is my, are my, you know, is my first book working? You know, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and, and where am I losing people? Cause I might be, you know, doing great up to book three and then everything just drops and nobody reads past book three. So where did I screw up in book three, et cetera. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a lot. Yeah, I've been looking at that is that I'm really excited about, but I haven't really dived into with reader links is this ability to bring on virtual assistants. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah. So um, one of the things that you can actually do there is a person signs up to reader links and they basically convert their account to a PA or a VA account, uh, which means they don't get charged. So it's free for them. Then you basically go into your pen names area and you say, I want to add a personal assistant. Um, when you go to do that, you set on applications, so you turn it on. That way people can't just constantly bombard you with requests. So you turn on the applications. It tells you what the ID is. You give that to the person that you want as your, your VA. They go ahead and enter in that information and click go. At that point, you see a notice that says, hey, this person has requested to be your PA. You grant access or revoke it or you know decline it so you can grant it. And then at any time, you can revoke it. Um, the only issue I have with the current PA VA system is that it's full access. We don't have permissions in there, which means they can do everything on your account. Um, which I don't love. Uh, so what we are current, what we're working on once Rafal finishes 2.0 is actually a better system, we think. And that's the idea of what we call book lending and or book sharing. And the idea is that th this is this also came out of being a little bit selfish. And also it's good for publishers. Uh, John, you'll like this. Um, the idea being that I house all of my books on my you know, main account, but I can share it with all of my co-authors, just the individual ones that they're in, you know, that they have. So they write their own books. Plus they have the shared books for me. So they can actually look on their main console and see how much money am, am I making overall? How much money am I making just from the series I'm working with John on my own series, etc. And we want to make it so I can assign a percentage amount as well. So I could say, you know, 50, 50 for this person, uh, 80, 20 for this person or whatever. And you can also share cost against it. So I could say, all right, 
every ad that I do, I'm splitting 50, 50, the cost of that with this person. So they're not going to see the money until they net, uh, until they, you know, reach their net, then they'll get it. Um, so we're working on that kind of thing, which is good for publishers. It's also good for virtual assistants and so on, because you can still share those books with those uh, particular people. Um, but you can also control what else they see. I mean, if you're, you know, writing Bigfoot porn, you probably don't want them to see that, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> or you could just be shame free. That's true. <laughs> now, John, that's an awesome oh, feature. I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah. Once that gets up, it's going to be amazing because I, 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 you know, would love to have a platform where my assistant can come in and work. But I also, yeah, I don't I don't need her see on everything. Yep. <laughs> Understood. John, you've been going like a mile a minute here um, and I, I've caught some of it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> understood a little bit less than that <laughs> we now know um, you don't work for nasa <laughs> yeah what no <laughs> hold on when was that brought up who the fuck is this yeah, guy apparently i missed something <laughs> no but I, I i've got i thought we were getting the nasa guy god damn. i've got two questions uh the first of which i uh i'm not quite sure how to phrase so uh, i'll have to ask you to meet me halfway here but um when, back when you were talking about the uh read through all right, so, you know, book one, 60% of people went on to book two, and then 90% of those people went on to book three, yada, yada, yada. Is there like a – and you were also talking about Facebook pixels and stuff. And uh, <laughs> All right, well, well now, slow down. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, – I'm trying to gather my thoughts. Um, <laughs> do you have uh, – is there a mechanism here where you can collect the uh, information of the people who did go on? to the readers who, who went on to read the whole series. Do you know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. Okay, good, good. So the, the no is the okay. answer. Um, <laughs> sorry, the, the problem there is, is that, as we all know, you know, Amazon hides the identities of the people. Um, and, and at the same time, so does uh, Facebook. So even though, so do you know what a Facebook pixel is? Yeah, I use them. Okay, cool. So... It, what that's going to actually do, though, is just basically tell Facebook who the person is, but you don't know. And so they're storing right. the information on that. That's why you can't ever see those people. Um, one of the things that we are trying to do, we're, we're never going to be able to get you the name of the person. Well, I, I, I'm not going to go visit them. I just, I, I <laughs> just want to target them. So I noticed he didn't move on to book free. <laughs> What's yeah. your problem, buddy? I'll target you. The targeting aspect is is perfect for the pixel, obviously, because you can build a custom audience and then target that person. Right, and and a lookalike audience based on that. Correct, correct. Um, but you know, that's one of the things that's nice is this: how many books are in Critical Failures? Uh, six and soon to be seven. So one of the things that we have recently um, introduced is a thing called a common identifier, and I'll explain that um, what I mean there. So. If you use a reader links link in the back of your book, and let's say that that link is just, you know, to sell the next book or to review the current book, what you can do is you can like. So as an example, in the back of my paranormal police department books, I will put um, a link uh, for selling the next book and then I'll put a link for the review of the current book and I'll do that all the way through the series. But the problem there is that, you know, when I have, you know, when I'm done with the PPD this year, it's going to be like 30 books. So that's a lot of books. And every time I go to create um, a custom audience, I'm going to have to grab a piece of each one of those links to put in that custom audience field. So, you know, if the link is like 102 and the next one is 108 and the next one is, you know, 212 or whatever, I'm going to have to put those all in. So what we did was we came up with this thing called a custom identifier. So now what I can do is I can basically um, edit that particular link record on reader links and I can just put in some something that means something to me. So I will put, for example, PPD for Paranormal Police Department dash BBS, which is back book sale or back book review would be BBR, right? Then I put that on every single one of those links for those books. Now, when I go to create a custom audience, all I have to do is put PPD BBS. That's it. And then from there, it will automatically track every single link uh, that has that particular uh, moniker uh, attached to it. So this is great because even if you already have, like John, you probably already have reader links links on the backs of your books now, 
And you're thinking, mm-hmm. I got to go back and, you know, do that. No, you don't. Even if you just go in right now on your reader links account and you add those and then you check the little box that says, uh, use these as page views, it'll still work. You don't have to republish anything. Um, it'll just do it as a page view as opposed to an actual link uh, connector. So it will still allow you to create a custom audience super fast, super easy, which is one, you know, uh, keyword. Um, and you won't have to, uh, you won't have to republish at all to do that. So th- this is just an, an example because this way you can say, I want to target everyone who has reviewed my book. I want to retarget. I mean, that could be bad. You might get you know, targeting people who hated your book, but I want to retarget everyone who has, uh, you know, purchased the next book from the book or at least click the link to purchase the next book uh, from the current book. We don't know if they actually purchased because, you know, Amazon doesn't tell us that. But um, that's kind of the, the, the point of all of this is that any links you have inside of your books and so on, you know, those are warm readers. So you from an ad, you're kind of hoping it's a warm reader, but you're not sure. But if they're in your book and they click sale, I mean, that's a pretty warm reader. And so you're you're pretty comfortable with that. If you're on your newsletter and a person clicks to buy your book, you have that person again. So that way, even if you send out a newsletter on your next release, you still want to do an ad for that custom audience uh, on that on that release, because they may not get your newsletter. Maybe, you know, whatever happens, happens, but they might see the Facebook ad and go, oh, I haven't picked that up, you know, or whatever. Or they see your newsletter, but they just don't act on it right away. So instead, they jump over to your uh, Facebook ad and see it there and then they click to buy. So we try to make it so utilizing that pixel with our links makes it easier for you to target the people, you know, are more likely to buy your books than just random people you have no idea on. Well, that was that was the spirit of my original question. I wasn't looking for their phone numbers and addresses, <laughs> of it, but no, I just wanted yeah, to know: yeah. Would you? Yeah, all right. Maybe some of them. <laughs> I was gonna say Bob, Bob's going to start creating custom audiences. Fuckers who didn't read book three. Fuckers who didn't read book four. <laughs> no, but I just wanted to know: you know Is there a dating, dating, dating shit, data collecting? <laughs> mechanism there oh, man i still don't know what the fuck i'm talking about but but you do all right yeah there is i know what you're saying there, there is but it's not in reader links it's actually on those uh it's on facebook where that pixel uh aspect is we can't collect the data because we would have no idea who the person is okay. and we do that specifically we'll for for your protection and ours because we don't want sure. to get sued for holding people's information so um all right and my other question is similar i think um Ooh, like I don't know, like thirty minutes ago when you started talking about this, you said um, you you can calculate ROI, and I was wondering, and you mentioned like Facebook ads. I was wondering how how do you do that? How do you calculate ROI on a Facebook ad? Sure. So um, essentially, if you're using the KDP uh, reporting tool that that we have, it, it allows you to you have to upload your report the first time. And after that, you basically just up, open up your KDP dashboard on the bookshelf and you click a link on um, like a bookmark, which is very much like what book report does. And we send your data back to our server. And every 15 minutes, as long as you keep it open, it'll continue sending back to the server. Now, um, at the let's say tomorrow morning, you get up, you go to your um, uh, Facebook ads console. And while you're there, you download the spreadsheet for yesterday. Then you upload it uh, to our server. Right? We can't grab that one automatically, unfortunately. But you download it from there, and then you upload it to our server. We automatically know um, at that point, you know, what date this was for. Uh, we know all of the books uh, that you have. You can then go into our, our ads section, and you can assign each one of the ads. Because we're not – I'm sorry, we're not going to know which book it is. I'm sorry. But we uh, we will allow you to assign each ad to a book. And then from that point on, we'll know what book it's, a t- it's attached to. So what you can do at that point is um, every time you upload your, your reports, assuming you haven't added new ads, because if you do, you need to assign them. So that way you have them you know, accurate. It'll tell you, here's how much you spent yesterday on ads. Here's how much you met, made yesterday on KDP. Here's your ROI. So it's just basic, you know, um, subtraction and then a, a calculation to get the percentage. Uh, and you can do the exact same thing with AMS and AMS Advantage ads. Does that make sense? 
kind of. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, it's, it's really just, you know, you're uploading your Facebook ads report to us, and then we take it and we do a calculation based on how much you made yesterday versus how much you spent yesterday. And that's pretty but much you, it. But you have no way to know which sales came from Facebook ads. Though. Oh, no, no, no. There's no way to know that. Yeah, all right. All right that's kind of what I was wondering. Yeah, there's absolutely no way to know that. All we can tell you is, you know, here's how much you made, here's how much you spent, and assuming that you, you know, attach – each one of those ads to a book. You don't have to do that, but you should because that way you can go into the book level and actually see how much did that book spend yesterday and how much did you make on it. Right. Yeah. And I think even if you just do that every day, you're probably miles ahead of most indie authors when it comes to tracking your. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's true. And, and, you know, that's the other thing to keep in mind is that a, a lot of this is estimated uh, information. It's never going to be perfect. Um, and the reason for that is because we don't know when Amazon's exchange rate hits. So maybe you have, you know, 10 sales in the UK or something and um, the exchange rate was, you know, 25 percent. But by the time they actually report it, it's 27.2% or whatever, um, some value. So there's no way to really know 100% with 100% accuracy. Uh, but our, our goal is really to help you trend and, you know, get an idea of where you're at, um, how, how you're moving. You're not going to be off thousands of dollars by any stretch. So it, it's like, you know, you might be off, you know, 50 bucks in a month or something like that, sometimes in your favor, sometimes not, which actually goes back to the co-author thing. Um, you know, one of the things I say to the co-authors is, you know, depending on the level that I'm working on, let's say it's a 50 50 uh, split that we're doing uh, is I'll say, look, I'm basing everything off of reader links. Um, I'm not going to go through and do a due diligence, a deep dive or anything else. You can see the reports just like I can see them uh, and everything else. But I am working through reader links. If that's going to be a problem, we just won't work together. And that's it. And so, you know, I'm I'm very meticulous about making sure that the reports are being updated and that, you know, everything else is part of my end of the bargain. But they do realize that some months they might be down 20 bucks. Some months I might be down 30. You know what I mean? So it all evens out in the end. But uh, that can happen. That kind of makes that makes sense <clears throat> because you're not working as a publisher. No, if I was doing a publisher, it'd be a little bit different. I agree. Yeah, we don't want to talk about how long some of that crap takes. Yeah. Well, and that, but that is a good point because as I was mentioning earlier for the publisher account stuff that we're working on, again, it's, it's, we're at the mercy of the data we're given. So there's really not much we can do, um, to ensure accuracy. And that's, that's, you know, it's going to be close, but it's never going to be a hundred percent right. And do you guys go in and update like, you know, the rates for, uh, like page reads each month? Like, so yeah, so what we, what we do there is we allow you to change it if you want to, or if you set it to zero, we do an average over six months. Hmm. Cool. That's smart. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than riding the wave, the big big ups and downs. Yeah, because you never really know uh, what it's going to be. And then once you find out, it's, you know, what, two months later. So it's all it's all estimated up to that point. Great. So you guys have any more questions for John on the reader links or his books or anything like that? Uh, no, my mind's pretty blown. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're back to Magic Cat here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get all you know crazy technical, but I started. Yeah, it was great. I mean, I'm sure you know smarter people than me will really appreciate this information. Yeah, you know, something. <laughs> ne ne next week we're just gonna we're just gonna like you know grab a guest who's gonna be like, "What's your secret of success?" I write books about Bigfoot fucking. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I'm gonna be on next week. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next week he'll be on as Lon Chogson. His student is very carefully crafted pseudonym. Yeah, just don't pick just just don't pick it like another uh, another uh, pseudonym that like works at NASA there. Yeah. <laughs> Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Bigfoot fucker. <laughs> okay, now that I think's worth probably. Yeah, I, 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 why, why is that not a series? <laughs> yeah, I, I think all of us are gonna jump on this tonight and start writing it. It's one small step for man, but what's this giant footprint about? Things are about to get sexy. <laughs> one small step for man, one giant dong for Bigfoot. <laughs> Low gravity loving. Yep. Hey, it practically writes itself. Uh, my old, my oldest just walked through the room as I said that. <laughs> He's like looking at me like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, come on. That's not even in the top 10 weirdest things you've said. It's business. Grow up. <laughs> this is just what the working world looks like now. Get used to it, kid. Your college education was paid for by with Bigfoot Dick. <laughs> and we're proud of it. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to telling my kids that. <laughs> All right. Well, we are over an hour. Um, ready to wrap this up? Pure. Okay. Well, thanks. There's really <laughs> only one answer for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, John. Do you, uh, outside of the new releases you've already mentioned and reader links, is there anything else you'd like to plug? No. Um, I mean, you know, audiobooks are happening here too. Uh, I do my own narration and, uh, for most of the stuff, cause I have a recording studio here, which is fun. And except for the Ononican stuff, which is handled by, uh, amazing, uh, narrator, uh, Just Sargent and, um, in the UK. Uh, and we just released, um, or we just put up Saving Major Wiggles from that series, which should be live whenever the hell Audible decides to do it or ACX decides to release it. So we're just waiting on that. But, uh, no, other than that, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fanboying here because I, I know a lot of your all's work and I really have fun with it. So. Well, where can people find you online? Oh, good question. John P. Logston.com is the hub of, uh, it gives you access to basically all the other, uh, sites, uh, there. So J O H N P L O G S D O N.com or readerlinks.com, obviously. Or, or the NASA website. <laughs> or the NASA website. Yeah. And, and actually fantastic fiction, fiction had me up. Uh, has me up on there, but had the other dude's photo up there for a while. So I thought it was pretty funny and just left it there. And, and then people would see me go, wow, you look totally different. I know I've been working out, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, I recently got him to change it to to me. So Nice. Well, thanks for joining us, John. I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. And happy happy yeah. early birthday. Oh, yeah. Happy birthday. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. And thanks for having me, guys. Really, it was fun. All right. And thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on Splam. If you enjoyed this, we hope you will like and subscribe and and shit. Uh, <laughs> join us next time in uh, the next leg of our journey towards self-publishing like a motherfucker. Mm-hmm.